mind bend. Non ordinary and extraordinary states of consciousness for a mind bend creative. Colin Campbell, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, thanks for having me. Congratulations on the completion of the New York run. Thank you. It's complete. You're here now. You're not yes. still there performing. <laughs> I'm in Los Angeles now, yes. Yeah, so how how was that experience? How long was the run? And uh, tell me about what led up to that and what, what, yeah. made, it, uh, what made it happen. So uh, the run was three weeks, but then we extended an extra week because it was selling so well. Uh, well that was very exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so I was there for a month. Uh, and it, it was it was a wild experience because you know by the end of the run I, I didn't really know anybody in the audience and as I told you I didn't really advertise and so the people that came like you know how did they find me uh, it, mostly grief channels right mostly people recommending me saying oh I saw the show mm. and and so a lot of people in my audience were grievers mm. and that's a very interesting dynamic mm -hmm. you know to step out on stage every show i've done i performed it 28 times now uh some in los angeles and then some in new york and i every single show there's been at least two people who've lost children mm -hmm. in the audience mm -hmm. i know that every um, single every show. single show how do you know that well because of personal like like i literally knew people in the audience okay. uh -huh. but then it changed and i didn't know them but they'd come up and talk to me afterwards um, do you make it a point to go in front of the house and I do. after the show? Yeah. yeah, it was always part of the show. The conception of the show was that, uh, you know, first of all, that at the end of the show, I realized I, I, I couldn't just have people applaud and then come up to me and say, hey, congratulations, because it's not that kind of a show. It's it's pretty intense. Yeah. Obviously, I'm taking the, the audience on a, a very personal, very intense journey um, where I open them up to grief and grieving, essentially. And so I just knew instinctually I'd have to end it differently than a normal show. And so what I did was I had the whole audience, that they stand up, they applaud. I often would get standing ovations. Or even if I didn't get standing ovations, they're applauding. And then I would tell them to stop applauding. And we're just going to sit. We're going to sit in silence. And we're going to listen to this, this cover of David Bowie's Heroes that a friend of mine recorded for my children, Ruby and Hart, after they were killed. And... Uh, and just sit there and just honor the grief that people might be holding in the audience. And it was a very intense moment uh, after the show to have that, that happen because people would be sobbing, just, you know, sobbing. Um, and other people were just st staying still. And it was such an interesting thing to do to ask an audience, like, sit back down. Like, the show's over, now sit back down. <laughs> And don't say anything. I said in silence. So it's a very weird, aggressive kind of move. But people really responded. Well, you gave people a chance to leave if they needed to. Yes. Yes. Yeah. They, yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah. acknowledge yes. that. Yes. Yes. But but nobody did. One person left because they had to go to the bathroom desperately, <laughs> and that's it for the whole all, all the shows I've ever done. On all twenty eight yeah. shows. Wow. Yeah. And uh, and so that was interesting, right? And they they would stay very still. And it was like uh, I, I felt it felt like a like a moment of holiness, like we were in a yeah. in some kind of a church or something, right? We're yeah. just holding space for grief. And so then I knew I needed to stay outside the theater and wait for people to come out because some of them are going to want to talk to me about their losses. And sure enough, they they every show people would come up and, and share, and they'd say something um, about who they lost, um, when they lost them, how they lost them. And, and we'd have a hug often, you know, uh, and not the entire audience. People, would, some people would just leave. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and some people would write to me later and say, I, I wanted to talk to you afterwards, but I, I was, I was in a state that I, I didn't, I wasn't ready to talk to anybody. Mm -hmm. Do you have your contact information on the ticket stubs? So I do. Well, well, I have my, yeah, I have my, um, uh, on the program, my, uh, my Instagram handle. Yeah. Uh, so so you become out. communicating with people through Instagram quite a bit. Yeah. So yeah. how did you wind up not publicizing the show though? Somebody had to, I mean, you know, somebody had to pay the, for the theater space, right? Yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yeah. So the theater, yeah, publicized in the sense that if you logged onto the theater, you'd see my show and, and I'd send emails to people, you know, my friends. But your friends but, can only go so far exactly. I mean, to fill a house for a right. run of uh, what twenty one shows or yeah. whatever it was. Yeah, you had to really. I you know. I don't know how they found out. I'm not a very good publicist. <laughs> but you've way. been in theater for a yes. long time, yeah, and, and film also, and you've yeah. had to promote work before, yes. and yeah. you know what that can entail. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I didn't. I didn't like take out ads. I didn't. 
you know, do any, any other than social media posting. Uh -huh. That was really it. What networks? You said there were grief networks or, or, or groups. or are you, Did you become aware of any particular entity that was promoting or that caught, latched on and helped share the message? Yes, only, only though, you know, uh, anecdotally. So someone would say, my, my grief group was talking about your, mm. your piece, mm -hmm. you know. So that's how it kind of spread within individual grief groups. And they must have found out about it somehow. Yeah, from somebody else who's grieving. Before New York, it was just however many shows you did in Los Angeles. Yeah. For the French Fest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So word spread. Yeah, yeah. We're, and of course, a lot of people in Los Angeles know people in New York. So yeah. I reached out to all the people. I did reach out to all the people who came to see it in Los Angeles and said, please recommend it to people in New York. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So they were diligent. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So you you the work you did before creating this work mm -hmm. staged work that you directed uh things you had written before yeah yeah theater and film so mm -hmm. some indie indie film i uh, wrote and directed stuff uh and then and then theater i mm -hmm. worked with a lot of different different small companies in los angeles doing shows over the years yeah had you ever done anything before that was this niche of an audience? And no. do you consider the audience to be a niche audience? Well, that's an interesting question. I, I feel like it's it's really open to everybody because everybody's grieving something, yeah. right? Everybody has experienced loss and hopefully not as um, devastating as mine, losing two children, but, um, but nonetheless, profound losses, right? Yeah. And if they haven't experienced profound losses, they know somebody who has, somebody close to them has lost somebody um, very dear to them. So so I feel like loss is universal and the fact that we don't talk about it in public is universal, right? It's a very much something that people don't express mm -hmm. publicly because people want to shy away from it. It mm -hmm. seems like, you know, let's not <laughs> let's not bring that up. That's too difficult, too uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. uh, and my show very early on, I say, I'm going to take you to some uncomfortable places. And I do. I take the audience to some places that are very uncomfortable, mm -hmm. for sure. I think that was probably the first thing that I latched onto to think that you would make a wonderful guest for this particular show. Uh, so much of what we talk about and what I've talked about with guests in previous interviews in the psychedelic space is about the, the idea of trauma. Mm -hmm. Trauma is a word in the zeitgeist right now. Some people have some feelings about it. Some people have others. Yeah. Um, but we talk about the residual effect, generational trauma, yes. cellular effect, manifestations of confronting in psychedelic and non-psychedelic states of mind. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a very, a very clear call for me to, to, to want to talk to you. And Grief, a one-man shit show, is a one-man play about your grieving process and your wife Gail's grieving process mm -hmm. over the deaths of Ruby and Hart, your children in a car accident. What year yeah. was that? Yeah, 2019. 2019. And the first yeah. time the performance went up was? Uh, was tw was 2020, wait a minute. Yeah, 2022 uh, in June, May or June. So we're just at about a year after yeah. the first performance close yeah. to it. yeah. What was interesting is I actually wrote the whole play very quickly after the crash. And I call it a crash, not an accident, by the way, mm -hmm. just because the woman who killed my children was drunk and high and yes. she got behind the wheel and she didn't do that accidentally. She, right. That was a choice that she made that directly resulted in the deaths of my children. Um, but um, uh, I started writing it just a few days after the crash. Uh, and it was very short. But I obviously had this need, right? I was a theater person, and I, I was undergoing extraordinary um, trauma, and I needed to process it somehow. And I chose theater as a way to process it. You saw it immediately as a one-person show? Did I, you see yourself doing it like that? Yeah, at first I thought it was going to be a stand-up, actually. Yeah. I thought it was the darkest stand-up in, in imaginable. It just begs the darkest yeah. humor, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. So I tell some... I don't really jokes, but I but I do. Um, the audience laughs at some very very dark things, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that was how I thought of it initially. Like this is going to be the darkest stand up you could possibly imagine, um, and then I realized later on as it grew, 
uh, that it was actually a, a piece of theater and a, and a solo show instead. Mm-hmm. And so uh, hopefully it's, it's more theatrical and less stand up. Yeah, and lyrical. You know, it's very song like uh, too with its peaks uh, and valleys and the flow. I, I always tend to compare everything to right. music. So, <laughs> music. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so I wrote, I finished it about five months after the crash. It was done, it was completely written. And I started memorizing it and I was going to perform it in in uh, March of 2020. And Tuesday, bef- well, the show is about to go up on, th- on a Thursday, just for a small invited audience, just to see it. What was this like? You know, I, I want to test it out. What's it was gonna- a year. It was a, uh, so March 2020. So less than one year after the crash. Right, right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You were ready to present. Year. I was ready to present it. I yeah. memorized, ready to go, and then of course the pandemic. So it was literally a Tuesday before the Thursday. I had to call you up and say, you know, I, the show's canceled because everything's canceled. What was that venue going to be? Well, it was called the Ruby Theater, actually. Oh it my was gosh. it was on Santa Monica Boulevard. Um, uh, yeah, just a small, a small, I don't know what seventy seat theater. And Did you seek that venue out in Ruby's honor? Was that yeah, purposeful? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it was at, it was at the I think it was called the Complex, and there were, there were like five theaters. Okay. And I said, I want the Ruby Theater. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but in a way, it was I wouldn't say a good thing, but it was. Uh, it wouldn't have been a great show because it was too raw for me at mm. the time. I was actually um, still so early in in fresh grief that I couldn't get through the show without kind of falling apart a little mm. bit, honestly. When um, did you try to do it? How did you stage well, I, it before? I, I was rehearsing it, and so I invited friends over, just like two friends, you know, can I, can I, can I deliver my piece to you? And afterwards they looked like they were stricken, like I had just tortured them. Mm. And they're so sweet and so supportive. But I was like, oh, my God, <laughs> this is kind of terrible. It's a mind-bending <laughs> encounter for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, of course, they loved Ruby and Hart. They're dear friends of mine. So they're grieving, too. So I'm, I'm talking about all these terrible things, and it's less than a year out, and it's, it's just devastating all around. Um, but then the pandemic came and shut that down. Uh, everyone went into lockdown. I actually wrote a book about grief while I was in lockdown. Oh, wow. Um, uh, so it's called um, Finding the Words, Working Through Profound Loss with Hope and Purpose. So I wrote that book, which just came out in March. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Um, and, uh, and then uh, People, the you know the, the limits of COVID started lifting, and I was like, you know, I want to do that. I still want to do that performance piece, so I rememorized it, <laughs> and then performed it in in twenty twenty two. It's part of the Hollywood Fringe Festival. Have you found a new additional calling as a grief expert? Well, I I feel like I I'm I say I'm an expert on my grief um, because I spent now almost four years nonstop thinking about it and processing it and um, reflecting on it. Um, and I feel like I have, I have some pieces of wisdom that are worth sharing. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, I have a take on it. I've read a lot of grief books, gone to a lot of grief groups. Um, and I feel like I have some, I think, insights or angles on grief that are a little different from, from, from many other books, um, and people are responding really positively to my book. Yeah, it's that's the whole thrust of the show. It's like that was your you saw a need mm-hmm. to address it as candidly yeah. and as raw as you did, and humor allows access to information in ways mm-hmm. that other mediums really don't. I've been around so much stand up since moving to Los Angeles, just kind of uh. coincidentally um, or or purposefully, but. Um, it continue. I've always known it to be, because you know it's it's. People have told me directly when you're able to couch it in humor. It might slip into somebody mm-hmm. else's awareness and thinking in a way that they might not have been like they, their defenses might have been up. Yeah. But when it's a, when it's humorous, <laughs> it gets in there, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think people come to my show with defenses up, right? Like this is a show called Grief, a one man shit show. What's what is this going to be like? And I don't want to go there, right? People don't want to grieve. They don't want to think about loss. Uh, they don't want to think about my loss. And and hopefully, um, like you said, with humor, I, I get those the, the armor to come down. Yeah. 
And that's that's something that can happen in ceremonial spaces. You know, I've mm-hmm. talked to guests that are practitioners of ayahuasca in particular, where yeah. people come in with all kinds of things they're contending with, right? And then they have this ceremonial experience where the hope is that they receive some intercession or some guidance or some connection to something that can help mm-hmm. alleviate uh, chronic suffering, mm. chronic health conditions or chronic mental health conditions, physical health conditions. Um, so that's I want to get to that idea yeah. with you shortly, but I do want to ask before I forget, how has Gail processed everything in a ways that are different? And she, I'm sure that she's supported you and what you've done, but yeah. she's not also gone out and done a one-woman <laughs> one, one show. No, she has not. Um, yeah, so she, I showed her that that first day I wrote, it was like just two pages, single-spaced, the, the very first iteration of the, of the play. Way two back pages, when, single space. Yeah, okay. and that was like, just I don't know, five days after the crash, something very, very early. And I said, "Look at this," <laughs> and she said, I-, "I love it. Keep writing." So she was, she was a fan from the start. Awesome. Um, and uh, so she wrote a book as well. Interestingly enough, oh, wow. <laughs> we both have books published. What's her background? Uh, oh, she's a, a, a television writer, okay, uh, and uh, and now a television director and also a, a film director. Proficiency with the pen. Is she striking right yes. now as well? Yes, she's striking. Oh yes. my goodness! Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, so, so she's been writing, uh, you know, for, for television since, I don't know, 1997, I think. So, yeah. So she's, what has she worked on? Uh, well, Blackish most recently. Okay. Uh, but she worked on Will and Grace. Um, she worked on Ugly Betty and a, a lot of amazing shows. Awesome. Yeah. 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 She's quite extraordinary. So she wrote a book. <laughs> she wrote a book and her book is uh, a middle grade book. So it's aimed at kids fourth to sixth grade. Uh, and it's delightful. It's like this wonderful, like charming, funny, fantastic kids book, uh, and uh, it's called the big lie, the big dreams of little creatures. And uh, and it's about a young girl who discovers she can talk to insects, and goes on this wild adventure. Um, so this was her. This was part of her processing. Yeah, yeah, and so the 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 young girl is modeled very much on Ruby. Right, uh, our daughter, and then there's a villain character, a fun villain character, um, who then of course changes and grows, but he's modeled on heart. <laughs> and then there are these two brother and sister ants, uh, you know, because they talk to insects, and the ants are really Ruby and Heart. Um, so, so she's allowing herself to process all these feelings about Ruby and Heart and love uh, and memories yeah. into this very charming, delightful. Um, kids book, yeah, and then I'm writing a, <laughs> a savage one person show about yeah. grief, but they're still processing grief, yeah, right? yeah. I love that she's imbued these characters with their energy too, yeah, and the other young people and adults, whatever, can can continue to benefit from that also. That's amazing, yeah, yeah. So I have to ask, did did you have any friends in your peer group say, "Come down to Costa Rica with me and do ayahuasca to to get uh-huh. through your grieving," or or come have a macro psilocybin ceremony with me and see if that can help? Yeah. Did you have people yeah. offering psychedelics as a as a modality of healing um, or recovery? Pe- people offered a lot of drugs initially. Um, I know that's part of your which show. Part of my show is that yeah. the idea of numbing is I don't want to do that. Right? right. I don't want to numb myself from the right. pain. In fact. So, uh, so I did not go in that direction. Um, I know people who have microdosed, uh, who are grieving, who microdosed, but you said macrodose. Well, that was just one example. Oh, okay. but in, 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 psychedelics <clears throat> in any capacity. Any capacity did you have yeah. anyone stumping for that? Nobody was stumping. Um, somebody mentioned that they were, again, microdosing um, just to process other losses in their lives, and they, and they were sort of suggesting that it was beneficial for them um, but they weren't really stumping hard. Nobody was like campaigning for me to try psychedelics. Mm, mm. So that so it did not lead to anything. You did no. not go through anything like that. No, yeah. no, no. I I like I like being clear headed or I don't know what that's the right word, but um in, in my processing of grief. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Um so I sort of you said earlier the idea that grief is is kind of a um uh, you didn't say it was mind altering. Non ordinary state of consciousness. Non ordinary state of consciousness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in a way, I want to I want to engage with it wherever that is. Yeah, you know what I mean. 
Yeah. 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 Did Did you have uh, any history of recreational psychedelic use? In, in yeah. When I, yeah. Yeah. When I was very young, teenager, um, I tried uh, uh, LSD a couple times and didn't love it. Yeah. So that was my that was my experience. Yeah. What's your experience with cannabis? Again, when I was a teenager. Yeah. yeah. I liked cannabis a lot. Um, is that, is, but but that's stopped. not persisted throughout no. yeah, life. Yeah, yeah. And what about alcohol? Has alcohol played a role in your life at all? Um, uh, yeah, just but very minimally. Uh -huh. I don't get drunk. So it wasn't a compulsion often. at all for you to overindulge or no. to medic self-medicate in that no. way during no. your, right after the crash? Right. So we did, we did notice, like Gail and I thought about it very consciously, like, huh, we're drinking, we're drinking more than we used to drink. Um, what's going on there, and we don't like that. Because we know people who who try to numb themselves, you know, with alcohol. It's a it's a kind of a it's a possible path you can take, you know, yeah. that seems like a bad path to take. Um, yeah. the whole idea of numbing oneself to the to the experience. Um and so uh well, we didn't really flirt any dangerously with, with alcohol use, no, but we were clocking it. I yeah. guess way to put it yeah so I, if we have a drink now and again that's that's all we do yeah yeah your community at the time has it changed since then like have you have you mm -hmm. brought new people in yeah. that are influencing your world or, or been more proactively outwards and building community yeah so i found community is so important in to me in the grieving process uh i talk about it a lot in my book almost the, the main thrust of my book is really uh, maintaining and building community as we grieve, uh, finding ways to be proactive and asking for what, figuring out what you need as gr in grief, because that's mm -hmm. hard already. Like, what do I actually need in grief? It's not easy. It's not obvious. Mm -hmm. And um, and so articulating those, finding the words uh, to understand your own grief, and then also finding the words to ask for what you need from your community. Um, so there's a whole bunch of... Uh, very specific things that Gail and I developed that allowed us to maintain uh, our, our current community, our, our friends and family, mm -hmm. bring them along with us as best we can. Mm -hmm. But we also definitely expanded our community because of, of the grief groups. Mm -hmm. So I know, sadly, a lot of people with dead children. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And whereas I didn't before. Right. And what, so what's the active engagement of that community look like now? Like, how, how are you involved with... with Furthering the dialogue or empowering the dialogue yeah. or help, you know. Yeah, yeah, with grievers, yeah. yeah. So I feel like my show and my book are my way of reaching out to people. Yeah. Um, and so every every other day I'll get, you know, a message from somebody who just read my book and it's very beautiful, you know, how meaningful it is to them. And um, and that's and we have a little brief exchange. Uh, and then I talk. I, I, I'm starting to talk to groups. So I actually went into uh, the men's prison two months ago and talked to... Uh, men um, in for, uh, I think mostly in for murder, that a lot of them were, were, were in for life or long prison sentences, mm. um, and talked about grief with them. Mm. And that was really interesting. How did that idea come about? Because that's pretty, that's pretty <laughs> powerful. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's from a friend in my synagogue, and she works on restorative justice. And she said, you know, I have this community of, of men who are really trying to engage in the consequences of, of their actions in the past, and they want to talk about grief, and I think they would they would really love hearing from you. That's something that they had expressed a desire to 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 discuss. Like, a, you know, I the, don't know if they've actually said grief per se, but I think so. I should ask her. I should ask her. You know, I think it popped up into her mind because uh -huh. she after after having multiple sessions with these men about restorative justice and um. And the idea of of taking in somebody else's grief. That's yeah. part of it, right? Is to actually accept the 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 the, the victims' families and, and their experience. Oh, that's specifically understanding what it, yeah. their grief. Because yeah. I was wondering like if you thought going in, what if somebody who I'd be addressing had killed somebody else's children? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well that that's the case. Yes. Yeah. That was the case. It was the case. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one one man came up to me afterwards and he said, um, you know, we have a, this was a general group, but we have a specific group about DUI, you know, men men who are who are on a it was like a committee, a DUI committee, uh, some of whom are just there because they're looking for meaning and purpose in their own lives. They want to make the world better, 
And then there are other people who are there specifically because they killed people because they were drunk driving. And they, they asked me if I could come back and address that group specifically more more intimately. So you're going to do that? So I'm going to do that, yeah. Yeah, in a couple of weeks. I think I how back. did it feel to do that the first time? What was that? What, 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 how did you, how were you changed when you yeah. came out of that? Well, it was, it was powerful. It was a powerful experience. There were like 40, 40 men. Um, and just taking in the whole notion that many of them had life sentences. Yeah. Uh, and had served, you know, 30, 40 years behind bars already because they had killed somebody when they were 17, 18 years old. Yeah. Many of them. That's what happened. You know, they were, they were in a gang, they were a teenager, and they were involved in a murder. Uh, and then their whole life is destroyed, right? And the, the, the person who's killed is life is destroyed, and their family's life is destroyed. It's just a, it's just a ripple upon ripple of, of grief mm-hmm. and loss. And what was striking was some of these men said, you know, I, they said, I don't, I don't think I, I deserve to grieve. I killed somebody. So these people lost people in their own lives, right? They, they, all of them experienced loss from a very early age. Many of their best friends were shot or their family members were killed. And, and here they are, grown men now saying, I don't deserve to grieve for my losses. Uh, and that was powerful um, and sad. And did you have to say, did, were, you, were you claiming to be someone that could give them clarity on that? <laughs> well, you know, I, uh, I think I have, now I've processed it more, and now I have more to say about it. Um, in the moment, After having been there. Yeah, and thinking yeah. about it. In the moment, I wasn't like, I bless you, and you can go and <laughs> grieve now. You know, I wasn't right. doing that. The official I was decree. Just, I was really just talking about um, just how valuable it is to be open about grief, to talk about the one you've lost. Yeah. Just literally say their name. Like that's something that some of them w- wouldn't do. Um, and, and so that was interesting. In, 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 a, would they, in someone's position, would they talk about the people that they killed? Say their name? Oh, um, I, I think they would, but they, that didn't come up. Uh-huh. We didn't, we didn't specifically talk about that. They, they, they would be grieving their mistake. Uh, well, I, well, I was suggesting that they would grieve their their own losses. That their best friend was killed when they were seventeen years old, and they have not fully processed Got that you. loss. Okay, okay. And now, what I would say to them is that uh, if you're trying to process somebody else's loss, say the loss of of the family of the person that you killed, you won't be able to do that until you've processed your own loss, okay. until you've actually thought about your own losses. Okay. Um, and so, it's actually it's a necessary. They they have the permission to grieve because they need to grieve in order to be human and, and feel the other people's loss. You know, mm-hmm. it's a, it's a, you have to grieve. As part of the um, healing, their own healing process over time. Yeah, yeah. And, and the whole notion of restorative justice. Restorative you know, justice, right. Um, for, for the victims as well, you know, their families. In mm-hmm. order for them to, part of the restorative justice, and I'm going to do it, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it justice, <laughs> but I believe part of the idea is is to put these people in dialogue with each other because the victims' families, oftentimes it helps them if they understand that the person or the people who who killed their loved one um, feels responsible, takes responsibility for that. Right. You know, and feels regret and whatever the feelings they have. That that helps the victims as well. On that note, were you and Gail afforded any of that by the person that killed your children? No, uh, no. So, uh, so she's still alive. She survived, and she's charged with two counts of second degree murder, and she's in jail, but not in prison yet because there hasn't been um, uh, a sentencing yet. There hasn't been a trial yet. It keeps getting continued because her lawyer keeps asking it to be continued, uh, and there because the charges are so serious. The judges generally allow that to keep continuing, so they can they can build their case. Um, so we don't know. We assume they're gonna, there's going to be a plea deal of some sort, but um, but we don't know. Did this person have financial means? Is that allowing it to, to drag no. on? No, that's just, no. just a state reality. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Has there been any effort on your part to try to engage beyond like what's normally done? Yeah. No, I, I don't. No, I don't think that's appropriate, like legally. I'm not sure um, for us to reach out. Yeah, to her. I, I have no idea, but yeah. I, I didn't know, like, you know, because yeah. you're you're discussing facilitating this reality <clears throat> right. with other people, but right. like, you know, there there there's your entire situation. Exactly, and... exactly. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, there's been no. I mean, even sense. a letter. There was there a letter or anything? Did, have they reached From out the, at all? No, no. So that's that's the other thing. It's like there's no sense of any remorse. There's been no expression of any kind of remorse of any of any sort. Um, uh, so, and then the night of the crash, she was not remorseful at all. Mm. Um, she was also drunk and high, right. but she was very belligerent. Not oh, to us, but to everybody else, apparently. Um, and so. So there's really not like a sense of like <laughs> culpability. Yeah, I, I don't know. I have or no idea. Or empathy at all. Yeah, that you so, know of. That I exactly. Yeah, exactly. Just imagining someone like yourself, ten years in the future. Mm -hmm. Right. Helping that individual understand right. you know, something more about yeah what they haven't comprehended yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I definitely um, don't know what the future will hold, um, but. Um, but in the absence of anything from her end, there's no, I'm not, I'm not one of those people that's like, I forgive people no matter what. I don't, I don't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Maybe she could earn forgiveness possibly. I don't, I have no idea, yeah. but I'm not going to. There just hasn't been any further engagement on that level. That. No, no, none. So Talk to me about what it's like to enter that stage space, that yeah. performance space. Like, how do you prepare yourself for that? Where does your mind go while it's happening? Are yeah. there ever any unforeseen moments <laughs> of intuition or inspiration? Or do you see a moment differently? Or do you interpret your text differently? Do you veer off right. dialogue? Like, <laughs> tell me about this, this yeah. one man shit show space. Yeah, it's very strange. So I performed before in, you know, regular plays. Um, not regularly. I'm, I'm, I'm more like a director and a writer, but I have I have acted but um, this is very different because I'm, I'm, I'm performing. I'm performing me. I'm performing me at an earlier state, right? So I wrote this play now three years ago uh, in, a, in a very acute state of grief, and now I'm in a different place. So I'm performing an old me, but it's all still true, what I'm saying. Um, but I'm not in that headspace anymore. I'm in a different headspace. Maybe that human. allows it to feel more like a character almost. Maybe, yeah. Going. Maybe, yeah, yeah. I'm playing, I'm playing a character. Um, but it's very real, <laughs> very real to me. And I'm saying words that are are um, difficult to say out loud, right? I talk about the crash. I talk about my children being dead. I talk about um, things that that could make people cry in the audience. People do cry in the audience sometimes. Um, and uh, I don't veer off script, so I don't... I don't improvise. Mm. Uh, I stick to the script. It's pretty much word perfect, unless I mess up or something. <laughs> but um, it, word perfect. But um, and part of the way, let me just say, part of the way you've written it is that it it's word. It, although it may be word perfect, it seems very, very, very intimately presently oh, now. Thank you. you. Know? Yeah, yeah. It, it it doesn't. It, it you've written it in a way, and you carry it in a way, and perform it in a way that feels immediate. Oh, nice, yeah. nice. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely written to be spoken. Yeah, it's not like a written piece; it's a spoken piece. But um, um, but it's a very strange place to be because uh, you know how I handle these emotions; they're real, but I'm also acting, and so I'm. It's it's a strange thing. So backstage, it's a non ordinary I, role. No, no, no. And I and I also I I don't. I'm not like milking things. You know what I mean? I'm not gonna like. Get myself worked. Like if I were acting this role and it were just a role, I, I might be more emotional, you know, because I'm acting this character who's suffering. But now it's me, and I'm not gonna dress it up. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna talk about Ruby and Hart and aching for them. I'm gonna think about them, and I'm gonna ache for them. But I'm not gonna fake it in a way. You know, it's a strange. I'm not gonna overact it. I guess is the way I, I think about it. I'm but, gonna be genuine. But you're even thinking about. It. I mean, I think that's 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 pretty interesting headspace yes, you know it's like yes. how do i not overact my <laughs> own emotions right right yeah how do i stay present and just be genuine about it i think that's sort of what i'm thinking about yeah and backstage what i really think about is uh, opening my heart i think about opening my heart because a lot of the things that i say early on in rehearsal my director I had a wonderful director uh, mike schlitt and and sometimes he would call me on it and he'd be like you know you're you're coming out it's you feel like you're like a little angry here, you know. I was like, right, I'm I'm angry because I have to do this play, you know, and uh, and I'm de that's defensive. I'm, I'm putting up a wall and I'm, and I'm protecting myself, you know. 
And so I try not to protect myself. I try to be like open um, to this roller coaster ride that I'm about to go on. Uh, and I do. I go on a roller coaster ride emotionally. Um, uh, I get. I get. Uh, I, I get moved during the show. You know. Um, so it's a very strange experience. Yeah. Yeah. How does how does this experience continue on? Like, are you going to do a film, a Jonathan Demi directed film on <laughs> on the one person show? Yeah. Or? Well, I I did film it. Um, I filmed the show in New York. Uh, with like three cameras, and and we did two runs of it, uh, with an with a very small audience and then a regular audience. Um, uh, so I have multiple angles on the show, and I'm cutting it together right now. But uh, I don't think it's the finished product. I don't think I'm hoping to use it to do a, a fancier version, like you said, you know, um, more produced. Yeah, more produced version, but only if somebody else wants to wants it right some streaming platform that right. wants to pay for it yeah. if not then i'll just it'll just be what it is now which is just i think a good job <laughs> but, yeah but um yeah, yeah. I, I can see the film very clearly oh thank yeah you. I, the finished product available nice. for streaming now yeah <laughs> uh, you yeah. you talked in the show about ruby's own struggle with mental health yeah considerations can you can yeah. you talk about her journey a little yeah, bit yeah yeah so um she, uh, right around, I guess, let me think of how old she was. I guess started in sixth grade. Um, she started, she was, she's a, uh, like this ray of sunshine, basically, <laughs> as a young girl. Mm-hmm. Um, so wildly precocious, a voracious reader. Trouble. Um, so smart um, and <laughs> so clever uh, and charming and... Um, Everybody was just delighted in Ruby, right? Everybody. Everybody loved Ruby. <laughs> that was just how it was. Adults, kids, little kids, big kids. It didn't matter. That was clear early on. Oh, uh, nice. Um, yes. And uh, and then she's she's hitting, you know, tween age, heading to teenager, and started to feel self-conscious, awkward, uh, started to get bullied by people. Um, was there a school change? That, that did she go to a different uh, school? Well, she did, yes. But it started before she left uh-huh. her 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 old school that used to love her. Things just sort of shifted, and kids start getting to be mean. You know, kids—they just sort of whatever it is. Um, and she was internalizing some of it, and then and and so she she was a lesbian, but she didn't quite know it. It took her a while to figure out, and somehow kids figured it out first, and. She didn't like that. She didn't like being labeled. And oftentimes it was a negative label, right? You're gay and it was a negative thing. But even when it wasn't a negative thing, when other gay kids were labeling her, she didn't like it either because she wasn't ready yet, Mm -hmm. you know? Uh, She was a little bit of a late bloomer. Um, And so I think that compounded with uh, developing OCD. Um, So she had an OCD that was like... um, uh, everything had to be even. So if, if she tapped her left shoulder, then she'd have to tap her right shoulder. Mm. Uh, if one shoe was on tight, too tight, it would throw her off. You know, everything had to be even for her. And she started, you know, obsessing OCD, right? Obsessing about these things. And it was interfering with her socially and emotionally and, and academically. And, and she started feeling suicidal. Um, it, it got bad. It got really bad. She felt trapped. She felt she couldn't get out of this whole because her brain was creating it right it was in her mind and her mind was so clever that we we bring these therapists in and she didn't trust that these therapists were smart enough to help her because her brain was too clever you know i think mm. essentially mm-hmm. um and then we tried lots of medications and those weren't working but then we found the right medication and the right therapist a very clever therapist and she suddenly was like oh and everything turned around and then also she started to enjoy her own sexuality. She loved that she was gay, right? She loved that she was a proud lesbian warrior, I call her, um, for social justice. And that was amazing to see, right? To see her embrace that. Um, so she had super short hair and it was blue <laughs> and she wore overalls and she had this, you know, gay pride pins that she wore and she was like psyched about herself. And everything changed. Um, and she became like the 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 bully's worst nightmare in terms of she was so full of so much self-confidence 
that she actually she went to a new school, um, and this is while she was still alive. A teacher came out to me once. I was in the parking lot to pick her up, and he said, "You don't understand. Ruby's changed the culture of this school. There's no more bullying." Like she ended mm. it. <laughs> she ended bullying at the school because she would protect anybody that was bullied. And she was so cool and so smart and so just powerful mm. that people just stopped bullying. They were just like, no, Ruby's cool. And she says, it's not cool to do that. So we're not going to do it. That's basically what it was. <laughs> that's the end of the line right that's, there. That's, that's it. Yeah. You know, everyone was like, Ruby's so cool. Um, so she was, a, she was extraordinary. Um, and that arc was so beautiful to see, mm-hmm. and then so of course heartbreaking. Yeah, that it ended right, right at that point yeah. in her life. Yeah. How did you? How did you, as a parent and and your wife, make yourself available to her contending with OCD and her contending with being gay, and at learning about her own reality at this juncture in our in our world in our time where yeah you know there's so much messaging coming from every angle like. How, how, can you speak to like how you yeah. engaged her and tried yeah. to help facilitate? Yeah. Well, um, uh, I'm gonna say poorly, but <laughs> um, uh, initially, initially. But uh, in terms of in terms of sexuality, we, we, that was confusing to us because we're so gay friendly household. Like, there's we have so many very very close friends who are gay who yeah. come to us all the time mm-hmm. in, in couples, and and we marched for for marriage equality. The four of us, like. We were so, and Gail worked on Will and Grace. Like, there's so much gay positive things happening in our household, you know, and being talked about that it was confusing to us why she would feel shame about it. Mm. Um, but, you know, the reality is that kids get their cues from their peers, not from their parents in that yeah. age. It's yeah. so much more powerful. Um, so she internalized certain elements of shame because of schoolmates, you know, making offhand comments. Um, uh, so we were very supportive of her sexuality. Uh, and, and, then, and then it was great to see her blossom, and, then, um, and that was great. But in terms of mental health, I, w- I didn't react the, the greatest initially. I was scared. I was scared by it. Like, she, w- she was falling apart, and I didn't know why, and it was just like, my reaction was, stop. <laughs> mm. <laughs> go back to, go to school. Like, we can fix this. What's going on? <laughs> stop overreacting you know mm. i didn't i was scared i was scared of i think the thought that she might have real issues you know that need to be addressed so i was a little slow on the uptake but then once once we figured out it was serious then we were uh, we were great i think and getting her help repeatedly trying different therapists different therapies different medications it took some time it took some yeah. tinkering and some different permutations of yeah. practitioner suggestion medication yeah, because you have to try provider. somebody for a while before yeah. it, it doesn't work, and you have to try medication for a while before it doesn't work. It, you know, first you you, you get put on a, a, a medication and it takes four weeks just to raise the level up to see if it works, yeah. right? Yeah, and then it takes a couple of weeks to see if see how, now that it's the right level, is it working? No, it's not. Okay, let's try a new one. You know, yeah. and that's that's challenging. That's challenging for her. You know, to not give up. Um, how, how did how did Hart see and feel what was happening with his sister? Yeah, yeah. He uh, he's extraordinary. He was an extraordinary young man. Um, he was also beautiful and empath- empathetic mm-hmm. uh, and sweet and caring, like his sister. Um, and he was like her biggest fan. He loved all of her artwork, everything she did. He would just be like. Oh my God, that is amazing! <laughs> he loved all of it. Uh, so in my show, I tell the story where she loved anime, and uh, and so she always would go to for several years in a row. She would go to the Anime Expo at downtown so LA Convention Center, and she'd make these amazing costumes, like amazing, really elaborate. And she'd sew. She was a, a very good seamstress uh, for you know a 16, 17 year old girl. It was quite extraordinary, but. Um, and he would he would just support her all all the way through, and she he'd get in costume too, and he'd go with her, but he didn't like any of it. He just pretended because <laughs> she loved it, you know. But he would follow, he'd watch the videos, he would watch Attack on Titan, and uh, <laughs> just so he could talk with her about all this stuff. Yeah. But he really didn't like it at all, <laughs> and, and she never never found out the truth. Um, that's that's real, but um, uh, yeah. So he was a huge and a huge ally of her sexuality as well. So uh, he had a very uh, mixed group of friends um, 
gay, bisexual, straight. Um, but he was a fierce, a fierce defender of of Ruby, mm-hmm. um, uh, and he was a great ally. Uh, I remember hearing him playing video games with other teen boys online. Right, so they got the headsets and they're they're shooting people. And someone says the f word. And he's like, hey, 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 no, 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 you don't say that. You don't say that word. And it was just like, this is like a thirteen year old boy calling out his buddies, um, you know, using these these slurs. And uh, I was just so proud of him. Yeah. yeah, and 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 they had a they had a strong rapport. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they squabbled, of course. Yeah. <laughs> they definitely had their squabbles, but but overall, they were a great team. Yeah, the spirit is present in the work, and I think that they would be proud oh. of you for for taking the chance and being animated and embodying so much energy because it's oh. such an energetic embodiment, right? Like you're carrying your experience and you're empathizing with their experience and. Um, there, there's just so much to consider in the work. Oh, I think it's really yeah. brave and beautiful, and I am a huge advocate of having the hard discussion, yeah, and taking the chance to put your ass out there and and be willing to say the things that are difficult for people to say, so that we yeah. can heal. Yeah, you know. Thank you. I agree completely. Yeah, we yeah, need it, to talk about the stuff in the shadows, right? It it's it's an it's an aspiration I have in this work and with this program and around all the dialogue with psychedelics, we talk about the lowering of walls. Mm -hmm. Um, We talk about integration, integrating lessons taken away from moments of insight or moments of hope. Mm -hmm. Um, Talk about the addict who is anodonic and devoid of any good feelings, you know, physiologically like right. hopeless and um you know we talk about these glimpses into other possibilities uh, of happiness you know and um none of that healing can happen without honestly confronting grief trauma uh, any perceived less than optimal condition and um I think just by setting the precedent, by having the conversation, you know, the people that are coming to the show, are you going to be doing more of the show? Is that an aspiration to continue yeah, to do? Yeah, it is. It is. I, you know, um, it it takes a lot out of me, but it also energizes me. You know, after the show, I feel energized. I don't feel. Spent. Yeah, I was going to ask you exactly, like, what's that yeah. moment after? Because, well, first of all, you have to go out front and say right. goodbye to people. Yeah. But then, then you have to get in your car and drive home. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or yeah. whatever. Right. Yeah. I mean, I really feel like I, I've I've grieved. I've grieved publicly for Ruby and Hart after each show. Yeah, and that feels good. Yeah, it feels good, but hard. It's not like easy to grieve. Nobody, nobody really wants to grieve, and yet it's it's healthy, and it it makes me feel stronger and more present in in this world. Yeah, you know. Thanks for making the work. And Thank thanks you. Thanks for sharing the work. Thanks so much. It's been so great. Yeah, and thanks for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me. You got it. (laughs) 